At only 19 years of age, the Argentinian intellectual and psychoanalyst Jorge Alemán traveled to Chile allured and mobilized by the political event of his time, Salvador Allende's victory, the first democratically elected Marxist president. During the visit, he goes with a friend to a painting exhibition at the Cuban embassy. This contingent decision had long-lasting effects in Alemán's intellectual career. At the exhibition, he bumps into Allende himself and shakes his hand, bewitched by what, seem, but by what seems an apparition. On the way back to the hostel, moved by the events of the day, Alemán and his friend go to the bookshop to buy Los Escritos de Lacan, L'Ecrit. I quote, we went to the hostel and we began to read the book aloud together. And to my surprise, my friend said to me that he understood it. I interrupt him there and I ask him, what was the meaning of the term signifier? Given reasons that respond to his own subjective configuration, my friend didn't find any obstacle in its meaning. Then he wrote a letter on a white page and said to me, this letter is the signifier and doesn't be anything. Following, he punched the table and said, here begins the true materialism. How to think of the political in a way that could allow a reading of society whilst opening the possibility of an intervention in the social fabric? How to provoke such intervention when capitalism in its articulation with technology, seems not to have an end. How to escape the circulation of commodities, images, myths, ideologies, narratives, that far from producing change, a cut, seem to be instrumental in reproducing the morbid fluidity of capital. A fluidity that Karl Marx understood and predicted in his task capital, one where the generation of surplus does not find a limit in the reality of the subject how to stop a movement that is strikingly shares the structure, resilience, and constancy of the drive as conceptualized by Sigmund Freud and later by Jacques Lacan. Something who say is to repeat over and over again. Could a letter that does not mean anything be the impasse towards the construction of a solution? We often think that we can access reality through words and the more sophisticated the, symbol, the symbolic tools we employ to explain the world, the more transparent reality becomes. A letter that does not mean anything puts a question mark on this assumption. If postmodernism implied the refusal to acknowledge any ultimate material consistency in favor of fragmented narratives, Today's techno-scientific techno empiricism lies in a different, yet equally, equally misleading illusion. The use of meaning, information, empiric empirically gathered data as the ultimate and verbal key to un unveil the truth of the human. The materialism of the letter, the conceptual platform of the emerging political thought in Latin America today, we propose, thinks of materialism which, guided by the clinical work of the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, vindicates against both postmodernism and today's techno-empiricism the gravity of the material principle in the discursive experience of speaking mortal and sexuated beings. The latter, the internal limit of any discourse, the gap that determines the structure that, in turn, in turn, determines any access to reality. As such, the materialism of the letter neither refer to the concreteness of reality as in empiricism, nor to an overdetermining economical structure as conceptualized by, by Marxism, but a more stubborn form of materialism, the materialism of what Lacan calls the real, as, quote, the real can only be inscribed on the basis of an impasse of formalization." End of quote. The materialism of the letter emerges in the work of Jacques Lacan and finds its political articulation in the dialogue between two Argentinian intellectuals, Ernesto Laclau and Jorge Alemán. 
particularly in the intersection of Laclau and Mou's notion of antagonism, as well as Alleman's Lacanian, Lacanian left conjecture. This conjecture postulates the contingent character of capitalism as premise to think any political intervention, an intervention guided by psychoanalytical praxis, as Lacan approaches it in Seminar 11, quote, the broadest term to designate, designate a concerted human action, whatever it may be, our emphasis, which places man in a position to treat the real by the symbolic, end of quote. Looking at the recent transformations of the European political landscape, particularly the case of Spain's political movement articulated as political party called Podemos, this paper explores the clinical roots, political heritage and possible outcomes of this materialism, a position that aims at articulating a political reading with its corresponding political intervention. As such, the clinical experience of psychoanalysis seems, sorry, as the clinical experience of psychoanalysis seems to point out, it is precisely the localization and intervention on areas of non-meaning which have the most significant structuring effects. The unconscious is structural like a language, Lacan famously affirmed, a statement that bears witness of his relaboration of Freud's idea of the unconscious in the light of the so-called linguistic term in the 20th century, where we can locate an anchoring point of this materialism. As Saussure observes, words have no meaning in their own, but as the result of difference, a signifier carries meaning as long as it's opposed to the other series of signifiers. For example, in March, we will march in a parade, and in May, we may go to London. It is not the context, but the very place of one word, word in the phrase that produces meaning. Meaning emerges from difference, since the very presence of certain meaning implies the absence of the others. Briefly, the unconscious is a structure like language implies, then, that the unconscious is organized by difference with no positive elements. In semantics, if semantic implies that one word is anchored to one meaning, giving meaning a positive dimension, in syntax, it is the difference that produces meaning. There is no immediate or direct relationship between words and things. This is what Lacan calls opacity of the syntax which means that the syntactic, syntactic aspect of language organize and determine our relationship to the world. To define the signifier implies to accept the differential aspect of language and to admit that it is syntax rather than semantics which determines what is thinkable or not. Well, it may be seen that Lacan was a structuralist. There is a crucial distinction between classical structuralism and Lacan. For the Parisian, there is a constitutive incompleteness in this, any structure. In fact, Lacan arrives at this latest work with this formulation, language is a failed structure. And it is precisely the letter which is our compass here, as if the signifier chain is what sustains the symbolic order, the letter is the inscription that registers the inherent failures around which the structure is formed, and in turn, the immanent limit of language. This internal impasse of language is at the same time what renders possible all limits and any discourse. A letter that means anything compels compel us to accept something that resists symbolization, as the letter is the inscription of an inner boundary of representation, the inscription of something that cannot be defined, but it can be either located, written or identified. In a topological definition, a border between the real and the symbolic, the rim of the vortex of the real. Here Lacan diverged from Wittgenstein. For the latter, quote, what we cannot speak about, we must pass over in silence, end of quote. Whereas for the former, silence is not the only option for the limits of language. We can also write the representable of words and images. The materialism of the letter demands then a shift away from a phenomenological to a structural reading of the political. Since the subject is an effect of language, 
reality is organized discursively by the symbolic. This is the reason why the psychoanalyst should never make of the imaginary the epicenter of her practice, since as long as the feelings are determined by the signifier, they are organized discursively. For example, hate or guilt are not important as such, but the, but the way the analyst, the analyst formulates a statement of her feelings. It is the symbolic real level, the patches of meaning that in turn are sustained by areas of nonsense which are determinant in an analysis. The materialism of the letters situates the political in that space. The appeal to factual reality, empirical evidence, economical or scientific, ignores the fact that facts are organized in a symbolic way. This is what Marx revealed by symbolic determination of inequalities. Inequalities justified by imaginary ideology, that is to say, factual reality. We must not define left and right in imaginary terms and lead the political intervention in this way, following the anecdotic of the situation, as we might fall into the trap of the equivocal nature of the signifier reinforcing without intention the existing symbolic order. It is precisely this shift which is at the core of Laclau's work. Following Lacan's emancipation of the signifier from any enthrallment of the, to the signifier, together with, with Freud's recognition of the social bond as a libidinal one, Laclau's moves from a previous imaginary conceptualization of populism concentrated in rendering types characteristics, different colors of populism into the investigation of the symbolic real of the social. Using psychoanalysis as a theoretical platform, Laclau moves away from the Althusserian concept of ideology to favor the notion of discourse. For Laclau and Aleman, there is no practice without signification, so then the discursive operation is political as both terms are equivalent in relation to the constitution of reality. Laclau and Aleman's move consists then in switching away of thinking politics as a mere narrative in order to localize the gaps or voids in the, in the symbolic to intervene in the wounds that language imposes the subject, echoing Lacan's formulation to treat the real by the symbolic. Even more so, both thinkers challenge the fields of politics to abandon the utopia of emancipation as a reconciliation of society to rather accept antagonism as the very condition of reality as such, the very point of departure of the political. We propose that this is what Podemos is doing in Spain today. The political space is captured by the narrative of there is no other option than submission to the economist, to economist demand, and both right and left political parties obey this injunction, feeling, covering, rather than exposing the antagonism, the local irrepresentable point of political syntax. In the effort of disputing the electorate and parliamentary terrain, they produce a hegemonization of the political space quote, diminishing the constituent and transforming political capacity, as Aleman puts it. Out of the occupation of Puerta del Sol by a Spanish citizen, symbolically called by the media indignados, the indignant, Podemos works as the positivization of all negative political demands towards the state, negatives in the sense of irrepresentable. This positivization of difference, differences is what we already call the signifier chain. Crucially, this new narrative is not a capricious, capricious act, since it articulates, it makes positive all negative demands, and in doing so, it nominates the unsinkable point, the antagonism. Inspired by Laclau's populism, Podemos gives place to a new narrative, not by vomiting a new slogan which responds to the syntactic configuration of the status quo, but rather by identifying and naming a letter, something of the order of the unthinkable. As Laclau observes, when we talk about empty signifiers, 
We mean that there is a place within the system of signification which is constitutively irrepresentable. In that sense, it remains empty. But this emptiness, this emptiness which I can signify because we are dealing with a void within signification. The poetic name for this impasse of the structure, the Laclodian empty signifier, is Podemos, we can, which works as a poids du capiton in Lacanian terms, tidying up all the demands around the antagonism, the irreconcilable point, casta pueblo, the caste, the consensus of political parties, and pueblo, the people, which names the dislocation and the opening up of a new political constituent space. Yet, it is of importance to notice that not any narrative could have the same potency to articulate all the negativities, but only those who touch, who touch the real of the impasse, activating what Aleman calls a reservoir of knowledge, the material inscriptions of ancient political failures that attempted to articulate emancipatory demands. This reservoir of knowledge is constituted by material traces of the latter. Another form of materialism, casta and pueblo, resonates with past emancipatory struggles. On the one hand, Podemos is the positivization of the multiplicity of negatives, negativities that articulate the demands and inscribe them into the field of representation. On the other, Podemos aims to take the power of a failed state by means of a contingent electoral moment. Indignados is the name of those citizens, of, of those people whose citizenship was denied by failed state. Podemos is at the same time the reclaim of citizenship and the possibility of a state refoundation. Populism as a, is a discursive political operation that works to re reorganize the field of hegemony now colonized by neoliberal dispositive in their, and their correlative discourses succumbing to the weight of institutionalized realistic economical measures under the name of austerity. Populism touches the antagonism, activating the dimension of the real inherent of any discourse, and in turn allow, allowing a destabilization of consensus, dislocating the very opposition between right and left. It is the materialism of the letter that orientates the intervention of the analyst. But what kind of intervention? What for? This localization of the impasse after symbolization renders, renders possible an intervention that aims to change the organization of Jewisans, or sometimes just to open up the possibility to interrupt Jewisans. This French and translatable concept, uh, whose closer meaning is enjoyment, is crucial for Lacan, and it refers to an excessive and paradoxical enjoyment that entails suffering. It is on the basis of Jewisans that Lacan conceives a theory of capitalism different from Marx, but not without him. Once Lacan finds out that Marx's surplus has the same function of Jewisans, he formalizes this concept, introducing it as an element of discourse. Lacan talks about the capitalist discourse, which is most important, which its most important characteristic is that its in inherent Jewisans is continuous. The discourse of capitalism is equivalent to the neoliberal dispositive that master science and technology to produce gadgets that plug or block the inherent gaps of subjects in order not to register the incompleteness of any structure. Capitalism disco capitalist discourse, as Foucault's device, is a dispositive made of knowledge and power that multiplies material and immaterial objects and transforms any entity into merchandise producing a, a continuous flow of excessive satisfaction that impedes either subjectivation or desire. As Alemans puts it, quote, to wait for a rationality that will stop the circular demands of capitalism is not to understand the logic which we are inscribed, a logic <coughs> that is on the side of excess rather than on the side of the lack, end of the quote. In fact, the new maladies of our culture are located around the structural difficulty of signaling an exterior to capitalism. 
The circular and unbound movement of capitalism implies that there is a difficulty in identifying a space, a point for a cut, for a change, a rearrangement of the terms. One point unfolds into the next point and so on ad infinitum. The Lacanian reference to Aletos Field, this environment populated by gadgets and images that we are submerged in, is the sphere that counter hegemony, constructed counter hegemony, uh, aims to tear. This logic finds an expression in what Aleman calls the metamorphosis of the order of poverty. Talking on the context of his own militant political activism in the slums, he, he notices that while poverty used to be a minus, while poverty used to respond to a logic of the lack, lack of resources of all sorts, the poverty experienced in the Visha Miserias, favelas, or other urban slums of the 21st century follows, in Aleman's view, capitalist, capitalism's logic of excess of Jewessons. This is to say a poverty that is the lack of lacking, excess of drugs, luxurious commodities, brands of all sorts, boundless violence, and so on. Quote, capitalism maintains poverty as a consumer while keeping it into poverty, end of quote. In making everything at hand available, to use Heidegger's Gestel, filling the gaps by offering uh, gadgets, happiness pills, and other merchandise, Capitalism makes the lack lacking, to use the Lacanian formula for anxiety, a new type of misery that in eliminating the division of the subject leaves her confronted with the death drive without any access to articulate something of symbolic consistency. To say it blatantly, capitalism kills desire and expropriates even the experience of unconscious. The Lacanian intervention here is instructive to introduce a lack that aims to interrupt the totalitarism of Schuessens. According to Aleman, Podemos attempts to construct a counter-hegemonic discourse in the epoch where we cannot imagine an exterior to capitalism. This is even more adventurous and <coughs> radical since it could inscribe the very possibility to interrupt the continuous flow of its Schuessens. The Lacanian left, then, proposes a politics of the fracture that for Alemans, quote, thinks emancipation not as an ultimate competitive, full reconciliation of society, but from the Lacanian subjective position of the non-relation, end of quote, from the assumption that there is something that is constitutive of reality that does not fit the real, the material point that haunts any discursive formation. What constitutes the art of politics then is a savoir faire avec, a sort of know how to deal with inherent gaps and difference in the construction of the collective will. In this regard, and following Laclos in his argument with Negri, the masses of, of, or the power of the people is not something emergent and sp spontaneous, but constructed. This, in the same direction, in the same direction, a cut, a new rearrangement of the terms is not a romantic eventual eruption, but rather something, something that responds, as in the clinics of psychoanalysis, the direction of the treatment, something that ultimately articulates contingency with the strategy. In sum, strategic, strategic construction of popular movements oriented by the latter and its coordination with electoral, electoral timing opens up the possibility to hijack the jouissance of the neoliberal machinery, another kind of unrepresentable and unmasterable real. Now we have two reals, the real of the impasse of the structure and the real of jouissance. One real is subtractive and the other is excessive. In the analytical act, an inscription of the real, the letter, transforms the signifying chain. And so it is in politics, as it is inscribing the real part of the social in the state, the very act that exceeds its own foundational possibility. For example, Spain abandoning the Eurozone seems unsinkable, yet it is the very execution of the unsinkable, Spain leaving the Eurozone, 
which uproots the previous assumption of its logical necessity. The material lesson of the letter uses the failure of any discourse as the very space where political truth is constituted and in turn the very space for a possible new social configuration. To return to the epiphany, the contingent encounter with Salvador Allende, we close this paper with many questions which gravitate towards one in particular. What was Allende's political novelty? As Siritsa member, Estatis Uvelastis mentions, there is a new form of European politics inspired by the innovative political experiences from Latin America. The materialism of the letter allows an innov innovative practice of politics which exceeds the framework of representative democracy, but at the same time is anchored in the semblance of representation. This is what was new in Allende's Chile, a move that was replicated more recently in other Latin American countries. It seems to us this was the formula of Allende's and this is the formula of Podemos and Syriza today. In light of the recent configuration of the political in Europe, the upheaval of what might be a dawn, of what might be an awakening, <coughs> might we ask if Allende's political experience, brief and traumatic as it was, might be a letter destined to interpolate the politics of the 21st century.